Okay. So I'm gonna while you're doing that, while you're pulling that up, I'm gonna remind everybody that we are actually uh, engaged in a game development series where we're taking an endless runner, we're taking Zigzag Boom, and we're breaking it down into its parts, and then we're going to rebuild it, almost like uh, the Six Million Dollar Man. We've got the, we have the technology, and we're we're going to uh, show you all the steps. Last couple of uh, hangouts, we were actually talking about the requirements and kind of the planning and how the project was. Uh, organized. So if you haven't seen those, go back and watch those Hangouts. I think that started out with uh, Hangout 128, 129, something like that. So go over to youtube.com slash coronageek and check out those videos. Uh, and then today's conversation is really going to be about uh, laying down some code and putting in the walls and starting the, the coding process. Is that, I'm sorry. Yes, my, my, my audio is on. Exactly. So last week I promised that we would get to walls and I I gave a hint that making walls is actually the most complicated seeming part of the entire development. You would think it isn't, but I think the big problem that people are going to run into is that when they go to create walls, first of all, what are we talking about when we say walls? What I've got here on the screen is a couple of screenshots or a few screenshots. And to remind people, the way this game works is, let me see if I can zoom in a little bit. The left image here is the starting screen and this little dot here is our character and we have a hallway in a sense that moves up and to the left and when we start the game the character is going to start moving up and to the left then if we tap the screen the character will change directions from minus 45 degrees where zero is up and down to uh, positive 45 degrees so we tap the screen and it basically goes left or right depending on where it was currently going and our whole goal is to stay inside of the hallway so the tricky part here is, is you would think that drawing lines at 45, basically what is lines at 45 degree angles, would be straightforward. But there are challenges. The first challenge is, is to, you can draw a single line, but if you want to draw two parallel lines that form a nice hallway like this with good, good corners and a little glow effect and a nice colored background, it's not as straightforward as it seems, especially when you want to introduce... Uh, physics and collision detection. Uh, another thing that makes this difficult is uh, after you get all that working you need to set up your initial screen so that it looks like this. What you want is the first hallway to be very long. You want it to be centered on the screen so that when you put your player in, in the center which is where he starts or it starts, it's in the middle of the hallway. So I experimented with a bunch of different techniques and what I settled on was um, sort of a, some of the techniques I tried were drawing lines. Now, you're not supposed to, you're, people always tell you in the forums, don't use lines for anything that you want to have um, collision detection on because while you can create lines and add physics bodies to them, the results will always be somewhat arbitrary seeming. They're not arbitrary, but you really have to understand the rules of how physics bodies work when attached to a line. And there, there are rules. So I did that first. Thought maybe, maybe I could <clears throat> experiment and show pe people how to do that, but that did not work out. Then I tried uh, New Polygon. So there is a more recent um, display object called the Polygon, which is you can create a multi- uh, what is the multi-vertex object? So typically, objects in Corona have four vertices. They're rectangles. Four sides, four vertices for the corners. A polygon can have four, five, six, seven, eight vertices to create an arbitrary shape. So I experimented with, just for fun, using an arbitrary shape to create the hallways. That also did not work well. It didn't work well because we ran into, I ran into the same problem, which is, once you put the physics body on, then you really have to understand the winding, um, the shape, the orientation, et cetera, et cetera. So long story short, <clears throat> I settled on the good old uh, new rectangle or new image rect, depending on which way we want to approach it. They both come out to be the same. They produce a rectangle, which can be rotated, positioned. You can apply a body to it, which will have the same size as the visual parameters, so there's no extra work. And let me just start walking you through this. So before you before you do that, I, I just want to 
I, I work best if I know kind of like visually, and then and then I get into the code. So you're showing us the screenshot of the Zigzag Boom, which is the app that we're using as a model. Uh, are you saying that this will be composed of rectangles? Yes. So if I, at the end of the day, what we're going to have is a hallway that has. It's probably a little bit hard to see my cursor here, so let me zoom way in. Um, it's going to have a wall like this mm -hmm. on either side, which is the part that your body will collide with, your character will collide with if you don't turn. We will create a little fake glow effect and a background so that it distinguishes itself, looks a little bit different from the, the entire screen, which is a darker blue. Okay. And I'm okay. going to walk you through this step by, step by step so you understand sort of the logic of how I, I approach this. All right? Okay. Okay. Thank so, you. So uh, before I do that, I just wanted to point out that last week I showed folks the different modules. Um, and one of those modules was layers.lua. So it's really important for people to understand that when you want to create ordered layering in your game, where you always guarantee that one object will be on top of some other category of objects, for example, let's say I want to display a background of one color, then I want to have my hallway, and then I want to display my player. But I always want my player and all the particle effects to be rendered over the top of the hallway and the background. Now one way to do that is to put them all in one display group and then do m magical heavy lifting to ensure that they're always sorted correctly. That's the wrong way to do it. The right way to do it is to create a bunch of display groups and then organize them in such a way that one display group is on top of another one and then when you create your background you put it in the group for backgrounds when you create your hallway you put it in the group for the hallway and when you create your player you put it in the player group and then the sorting vertically top to bottom bottom to top as far as how you look at the world is always handled for you there's no thought involved so I have created, and we're going to come back to this again and again, because um, when we start talking about cameras, probably next week or the week after, we're going to talk about how we can use display groups to create a camera effect. And I won't go into too much what a camera effect is, but the camera effect that we are going to achieve sometime in the future is the player, when it moves, will always seem as if it's staying in the center of the screen, and the world will move around it. So the way you do that, in a nutshell, is put the player in one group, put the other contents in another group, and move the groups around, and then reposition the player every frame so that the player gets rendered in the center of the screen, and everything else is moved sort of the opposite direction the player was moving. It'll all become clear next, next week or the week after. Okay. So, so back before, to layer. Before you go on, uh, yeah, but I have a question about the layer. Okay. Uh, so when you add, let me just make a clarification, or you you know get you to get you to make a clarification. Sure. When you add objects in Corona, they they, they follow a, a pattern where if the first one that is added is um is is the is the bottom layer, I guess you could say, and then and then when you add something else, it gets added on top of whatever that is. So if you're going to lay down a background image, and then you could lay down a player, and then you could lay down whatever else right and then they would be stacked on top of each other so are you are you so you're saying that you shouldn't normally do it that way or that things should be put into you these should layers not rely or? upon that you should understand that it works that way mm -hmm. I'll, I'll explain why okay, okay. Um, first of all you're correct um, in corona if you don't make your own display group ever there is still one display group that is created for you. It's called the current stage. The current stage is sort of like the master display group that contains everything in your game, all the rendering, all the display objects. So if you don't specify a display group when you create an object, it's put in the current stage. Now the way Corona works, it uses what's called the, <clears throat> the painter's model. The painter's model says that when you create object A and then you create object B later, and you put them in the same position, object B, because it was created later, will be rendered over the top of A. Basically, anything created later is always rendered over the top of things that are created before those things. 
if you don't hear it. So, because display groups are themselves layerable objects, you can create them in a specific order, which will ensure their vertical layering. So, for example, if you look at the code I'm showing here, I create a group called Layers, another one called Underlay, World, Content 1, etc., etc., and up to line 41, the way these are organized is Layers is first, Underlay is on top of that, World is on top of that, and so on and so forth. So to that point in the code where the painter's model has been enforced. Uh, just a note, you'll notice that I created layers, which is it's a local variable at the top of the file. So I created a group and stored it in layers. And then I said layers dot underlay. Now the reason I'm doing this is because I'm going to pass this variable around in my code, but I want to have easy access to all these other display groups by name. So later, when I wanted to put an object in layers underlay, I could simply do this. Layers underlay. If I had a reference to this variable here, I could type layers underlay insert and whatever the object is that I wanted to insert into the group. So what I do for my own ease of programming is I will create one master group and then I will dot notate the names give unique names to every other layer and have a reference to them so that I can always refer to them by name. It just makes it easier to code, easier to understand later on when I'm looking at my code. So let me undo this change here. Got a little ahead of myself. All right. Okay, so at this point on line 41, it created a number of layers. They're organized in the painter's model, bottom to top, the creation order. Not what I want. What I really want is I would like to have underlay beneath world, world beneath overlay, and overlay on top of everything else. In addition to that, within the world group, I want to start creating a bunch of sublayers that each of them will be above underlay and below overlay. The other way you can control ordering in Corona is when you insert an object into a group, that object instantly becomes the topmost layer within that group. So what I'm doing here is I'm saying layers and then I insert underlay, world, and overlay. So these are all now sorted. Underlay is in the bottom world is on uh, in the middle and overlay being the last one is now on the top. Then I take content one, two, three and I insert them into the world. And what that gives me, I'm going to zoom way in here, is from bottom to top now underlay is on the bottom, world is above that, and then within that group is content one, two, and three and finally on top of everything else is overlay. With this small set of groups, now I have a place to put my background images to ensure they're always in the background. I have a place to construct a layered world where I can put hallway elements and ensure that some are on top of others. For example, I'm going to put my player in content 3, but I'm going to build my hallway using content 1 and 2 because I want to have certain layering rules for the parts of the hallway. So, so are we, then the, the big benefit here is that we have a much more robust way of, of creating and managing the, the layers of our content? Is that what we're talking about? Or yeah, absolutely. There, At this point, now we have a series of groups which we know exactly how they're organized from bottom to top. And when we put our objects into those groups, we always ensure the objects rendering relative to the other layers. Within a group, Things will still be on top of each other and following the painter's model. But by doing this, we've simplified our creation rules greatly. And you don't have to worry about doing two front and two back and resorting things manually. It's not, all that goes away when you start using groups. Okay. Yeah, I, 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 it, mentally, again, I, I like to get a visual picture of these types of things. I'm, I'm thinking I'm looking at Photoshop. 
and I've created, you know, 20 layers. And one of those layers is, you know, a foot, and one of those layers is a head, and one of those layers is a, you know, cloud. And I'm like, eventually you're like, oh, I don't, um, I, you know, you start moving things around in order to get things in the right order, and it kind of get really get confusing. So, you know, in Photoshop, you create a group, and then you take and you stick all that, or you know, which looks like a little folder, you stick all the related items into that group, and then now you're just managing the groups. Uh, now you've got or, a hierarchy. Ordering of the groups. Yeah, now you have a hierarchy, and so. Uh, I just want to make sure that everybody gets gets kind of a, a mental picture of what we're talking about and and why we might want to do that. You know, as opposed to just the default, like you said, putting everything into the, the one um, default group. So, um, yeah, that's exactly why I do it because otherwise you're just trying to manage chaos, and it's very hard as your game has more and more objects in it to remember and to control what objects are visible on top of other objects. And, and in fact, it becomes impossible once you introduce interfaces to control things correctly. You need groups. Uh, it's worth mentioning that we did all this by hand, but all of this coding using, I have, an, I have a tool in SSK, which we're not going to use on this game. We'll use it in future games. For creating custom layer layouts, and all you do is call the function and pass in names for the layers, and it produces them in the, the order that you pass in the names, and you can create grouped sublayers with this too, one, one depth of sublayers. So we could have created all of this in one line of code, but I wanted to demonstrate this time around the principle of it, and so you can look at the code and understand how this comes out in the end. So let's go to main.lua. If we go all the way to the bottom, our master module, which I mentioned last week, which is game. The first thing we do is game init. And then if we look at game init, we'll see a function in here called on line 36 called public.init. And what this does basically is one of the first real pieces of work it does is it create it calls the layers module and tells it to create those layers, that bit of code that we just looked at. That function itself will return a reference to layers, which then we can use to initialize the other modules. Now, I haven't done it yet. We're going to uncomment code as we go along in our discussion here so you can start to see things happen. But on line 45, we would initialize the one touch input and pass in layers because it's going to need to know about those layers. You can initialize the player module and pass in the layers because, again, it needs to know about these layers for rendering things. And finally, which we are going to leave commented, uh, uncommented at this point, we can initialize the walls module. <clears throat> so let's jump into what the walls module does, and then we'll come back here and start adding more things if we have time. So you'll recall that when I said that we were going to... Um, let me get this running here. <clears throat> we were going to do this. What we want to do is we want to break down the wall drawing problem to something as simple as possible. And so to do that, we will draw lines initially to show you what we're trying to do. And then I will break it out into creating actual rectangles and moving them around and, and explaining how this works. Let me take a look at the initialization code. There's nothing that needs to be said here. All we do is take the layer that is passed in as parent and store it locally in a reference to layers, which is a global a local variable at the top of the file. Let me let me go back into game. Sorry here, I got a little discombobulated. Um, one of the things is is when we initialize our, our game, if you remember from the image, the starting screen has the player, but it's not moving. It has an initial long hallway that goes up from the bottom right to the top left, so it's a very long segment before it starts twisting. And so this is what we're trying to achieve. So when you initialize the game, one of the things it's going to do is it's going to set up all the layers and it's going to tell the modules, it's going to initialize the modules, but then it's also going to need to start drawing these segments, the initial hallway segment, which is what we're going to create today. <clears throat> so on line 50, the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to uncomment some code which is going to draw a blue background so we have something better to look at. And when I do that, I'm going to put the blue background in the underlay so that it's below everything else. So now let's save that code. 
I have a little window over here which I'll make bigger later so you can see it, but I'll keep it small as we go along right now so we can see the code and the results at the same time. <clears throat> okay, so now the background is blue, but the other thing that this code did is this rather complicated, and I won't explain it all quite yet, piece of code, but the important part here is it called a function called new segment within the wall module. And it's going to put the segment at position X, Y, which we've calculated above. I'll explain this later. It says make the segment at a minus 45 degree angle, which is what this argument is. And then it's going to give it a length of first length, which is 200, and a path width of path width, which is 100. So it's going to be 200 pixels long, 100 pixels wide. Now, clearly what we're showing here is a line. So let's start to break down the code and see how to make this line be something more useful. One of the first things I discovered when I did this was the easiest way to draw a hallway is to draw something, center it, and then return a, return a couple of values to tell me where the end of that segment was. So when I draw my next segment, that I can simply start from that point because this is an endless runner. What's going to happen is we're going to be producing more and more hallway segments as we go along. So we need to know where the end of the last hallway segment was. So we can create our next segment right there and then more and more and more always advancing. So the first thing we do, and this is really complicated seeming, but it's relatively straightforward once you understand the principle. I took a function called angle to vector fast, which comes out of the SSK Corona libraries. And I'm, I'm not going to show you how it works today because this we can do a discussion of 2D math in the future. But basically what this function does is it converts an angle into a vector, a unit length vector. Now a unit length vector, for people who don't understand this, is a vector whose length is 1. And the reason a unit length vector is important is because we can then use that in all kinds of interesting ways. For example, for people who understand 2D math, we can take a unit length vector and convert it into a line segment, in a sense, by multiplying it by a value of, say, 5. And that would say this line segment is now 5 in length. It's a nice malleable vector that we can choose the length. Not, I'm not doing a very good job. I'll just walk through the code. How's that? So angle to vector. I take the angle. It's going to re return an x and a y, which represent the vector. I'm going to use another function. I'm going to pass those x, uh, x and y values in, which I call vx and dy, and a, a length argument. Now, remember, I had a length of 200 pixels. So what this is saying is create for me a vector whose length is 200 pixels. And the angle of that vector is 45 degrees to the left, minus 45 degrees. So that's what we have at this point. Now the only thing we have to do is position it. Now people who are listening to this who are not familiar with 2D math, just bear with me, but those who are familiar will understand that the way that you position a vector in any world view is simply by taking the vector you have and adding a value to it. So our vector at this point is, you can consider it positionless. It's merely a length. But by adding the initial x and y to it, what we're saying is, is move this vector to that place in the world. And then finally, after all this, I can draw a line that starts at x and y and ends at vx, vy. So all of that work was basically to, to take this point here and draw a line 200 pixels to the left and up so that we have this little endpoint right here where my, my cursor is going around on the screen, which is what you're seeing. So, for example, if I made this link or width 4, you see that that's the line that we just created with this code. Now I just made it a little bit thicker just so you could, you could see it in the demo. So not very useful. However, let's go back to the game. And let's uncomment the rest of this code here. I'm not going to explain too much what it's doing, but what it's doing in a nutshell is it's drawing a segment, it's returning 
this last position right here, which then we will pass in as the next argument, and tell it to draw from here at a certain angle for a certain distance, and when you're done, return the position of the new end of that line. So every time it draws a line, it's going to return the last position of this, basically what you could consider as like the dot that would go there. So let's, <clears throat> let's save that. Now what we've got is a four segment line. We can't see it all because it extends off the screen, but we got one, two, and three, and then this last se segment is off of the screen. So I could, I could theoretically just do this. So now we've got progress. Now we've got a zigzagging path of sorts, but it's completely useless to us because there's no walls. There's not really a path, but it gives us the outline of what we need to do. It was this point that it occurred to me that the easiest way to make this work is now that we have this, these segments, I can find the middle of every segment doing just a little bit of math, and then I can place a rectangle here and rotate it, a rectangle of the correct length, and rotate it, place another one in the middle of this segment, rotate it to the right, this segment, rotate it to the left, and as long as they have the right length, what I will have is rectangles that are over the position of these lines, which is what this next piece of code does. So this is step one of making the walls, of understanding how we make the walls. So I'm going to uncomment line 59, and then the math that I'm doing here is basically what I want to do is calculate the center. And calculating the center of a vector is as simple as taking the two components, Vx and Vy, and then subtracting the position offset, dividing that value by 2, and then adding the position value back. So what I have done uh, mathematically is a vector defines um, a direction and a position, but I want to take the position part out while I'm trying to find the middle. It's, this is not a math class, so just, just trust me that what you have to do is move it to the center of the world, in a sense, is what we're doing here. We're taking the positioning out by subtracting x and y, which is from here, taking that resulting value, dividing that by 2, splitting it in the middle, and then re removing it back to where we want it, the offset, in a sense. And what that produces is the position of the center of this line right here. Then I say, create a new rectangle, put it in layers content 2, which is our middle layer in the world, place it at mx, my, which is the center position here, make it 4 pixels wide, that's just an arbitrary, arbitrary value that I chose, and make it as long as the segment is supposed to be, and then rotate it by the angle. If I did not rotate it, this is what we would get initially. It's a bunch of rectangles, very thin rectangles, centered on the, these lines. But simply by rotating them, now we've got a bunch of rectangular segments. And I'll make this a little bit bigger so people can see it. Rectangular segments which overlap perfectly the line that we just drew. Now we're getting somewhere. Now we got like one half of our wall. It occurred to me, well, it occurred to me before I did this step, but that once you've done this, once you've solved this problem, I'm waving at the screen like people can see me, all you really got to do is create two rectangles and then move one to the left by a certain amount and one to the right by a certain amount, and you'll get a hallway. So to prove that out, I'm going to comment out these two bits of, line, of code because that drew just one wall. I'm going to go here to line 69. I'm going to enable this bit of code. I'm going to use the MX MY from our last, which is it's the center piece here. Let me move. Come on, get out of the way. It's the center bit here. I'm going to create two rectangles that initially will be right here, but then what I do is I move one over by half the width of the hallway to the left, and I move the other one to the right by half the width of the hallway, so that in a theory we get the whole width, correct? They're still four pixels wide each, and they are the same length, let me take this bit out, 
same length as they were before. So let's do that. Oh, and then I rotate them both by the same amount. And if we make sure that's saved, if we run that now, now we have our original line, which showed what we were trying to achieve, but now, now it's starting to look like a hallway. But we have got a problem. We have got this little gap. Why do we have a gap? Because the more we move these to the left and right, the longer they have to be to overlap. And in fact, the math of this is simple. Actually, it's, this is not true. It doesn't matter how far you move them. Because they have a thickness of four pixels, they each need to be two pixels longer on each direction. So all we got to do to get a nice overlap is add four, basically add the width. Whatever I choose here, if I made this eight, I'd have to make this eight. So let's add four to each one. I can type. Put that back to four. Save it. Now we have perfect hallways. Exactly angled, overlapping, no extras. Everything looks, it's starting to look real good. But we're not quite there yet. Now let's move on to the step which is sort of what I call beautification. What we'd really like to see is something that at least approaches, if we forget about these extra hallways in the background, just the main hallway, we want it to be blue with a little bit of a glow with a different blue so that people can clearly see what's going on on the screen. So let's do that. The way we do that is I basically took a screenshot of this into my uh, my um, I don't have Photoshop but you could take it into Photoshop I did a grab and I said what what is that color what is this color what is this color and I pulled the color codes out the hex color codes so the hex color code that I pulled out for the hallway edges the uh, the walls was eight uh, was zero uh, x a eight c b d e but for color codes in Corona we need to split these up into R G B so if you have a color code that is AABBCC in hex, all you got to do is take the first two, second two, and the third two, split them apart, say 0x because it's a hexadecimal number, 0x, the color code. So if this was AA, I'd put AA. Take that. That now becomes a number, which will be calculated by Lua, and then divide it by 255 because the hex color codes that you're going to be using in your program will be uh, 0 to 255. A long story short, I snagged the color from the image. I figured out that the first part was A8, the second part was CB, and the second part was no, the third part was DE. That. I then split them up, put a 0x in front of it, divided by 255, and I created this table. Why did I create a table? because I didn't want to type this every time. So if I create a table with entry 1 is the red part, entry 2 is the blue part, and entry 3 is the green part, later I can call set fill color, and then I can use this Lua function called unpack and pass the table, and this right here would be the equivalent of if I had typed this every time. But now if I wish to adjust this color, I can simply adjust it up here, like make it more green or uh, blue. Now I don't have to type these two lines again. And any place else where I use the fill color, it's all done because I'm using this table and it's used over and over. Okay, so let's do that. Let's save it. Okay, now we got a kind of blue edge. Now let's add a, the path background. So adding a path background. Kind of tricky. What we're going to do in practice is we're going to draw a rectangle over this segment right here and we're going to use just basically draw a fat rectangle that is as wide as the hallway is from here to here. But this is going to create for us a problem because it's not going to completely fill the hallway. So we just drew basically a rectangle here, rectangle here, but there's little gaps missing. The other thing that we have trouble with when we do this is how, how wide is this rectangle supposed to be? 
it's not actually the width of the hallway as we've chosen it, because the width of the hallway is horizontally a certain distance. This is another one of those math problems. Because we've rotated to a 45 degree, the true width from this line across the segment to this line is the width that we chose horizontally divided by the square root of 2. So let me, let me be clear. If you have a 100 pixel width horizontally, and then you rotate it to the left. That's how do I? That, that's not right. Okay, no. So if you'll recall, what we've done is we drew two rectangles, and then we moved one a certain number of pixels. Let's call it 50 pixels to the right. Another one 50 pixels to the left. Well, that doesn't mean that the point between here and here is 50 pixels. That's not right. The distance between here and here is 50 divided by the square root of 2. The distance between here and here is 50 divided by the square root of 2. It's just a math question. So what you'd see if I had not done that, if I'd said assume that it was the width of the hallway, is you would get this. This is the true width that we tried to achieve for the hallway. So from any point horizontally here, straight across is the same distance as here down at an angle. It's wrong. It's too thick. It's actually, the hallway is not quite 100 pixels wide. It's closer to like 78 pixels wide or whatever it is. Square root of 2. Anyways, so let's put it back. So e easy trick. 45 degree angles are wonderful. Um, for people who are familiar with the Pythagorean theorem, the other way to do this is to figure out well, how tall is the rectangle or the triangle, and how wide is the foot, and a squared over c, well, a squared plus e, b squared equals c squared, or whatever the heck, heck it is. I can't even remember the dang thing right now. You could apply that, but 45 degree angles are beautiful because the shortcut to that is the distance is basically whatever the width was you had divided by the square root of two. So just just follow my code, I guess. Really, yeah, we should do a math segment. Some, somewhere yeah, is, my, my, my high school math teacher is, is pointing and laughing at me right now. I, I know. I'm not doing a good... No, you're, okay, doing, a, you're doing a fine job. It's just a, I'm yeah. not a math teacher, so I'm really right. bad at explaining. The problem here is I understand it well enough to do it, but yeah. not well enough to explain it to a layman. Yeah, that's okay. But that, that the point the point being that it's you would think that it's 50, 50 pixels here, 50 pixels there, but it's not. And so, yeah, it's not. Because okay. we didn't really make it wide. What we did was we just moved these things left and right. But then we achieved this segment here, which is some width. We just don't know what it is. Okay. The easy answer is it's the width that we tried to achieve horizontally, but divided by the square root of 2. Sim simple as easy as pie. So how do we solve this problem with these gaps? Because what we've done is we've drawn a rectangle that basically overlaps our original line. Great. The trick is, we know that if we think about it for a minute, that this is nothing more than a square that has an edge length of one half the width of this hallway. So all we got to do is create a square that has this width for each of its sides, it's a square, and we'll move it over by one quarter of the hallway width and rotate it by the angle. Because you can see it. It's like, think about it. What is this? It's a square, rotated, certain width, easy. So let's go ahead and create a rectangle. Give it the width over the square root. So same value as this. Give it a fill color. And, and all we do is rotate it. So was this was this solution less expensive than just say like trying to figure out that I need to make my rectangle you know fifty pixels longer? Yeah. So the other choice was let me let me uncomment this code so people can see what you're saying. The other thing that you could try to do is you could try to get tricky and make this rectangle longer and this rectangle longer so that they perfectly abutted. But there is no simple. Simple, there's, a, there's a way to do this mathematically, but it, I, it was too hard to explain. 
If you think I'm having trouble explaining divide by the square root of 2, the math for calculating this, not easy to explain. Okay, It's not a factor of the square root of 2 anymore. And I said, you know what? Let's just do this. It's going to cost us one extra rectangle to cover it up. But we're not going to keep them around forever, which is a discussion for another day. But later when we go into camera work, I'll explain how, how we create and delete things over time. But we're not going to have a bunch of rectangles forever. So okay. we'll just create two rectangles to solve the problem. Easy peasy. And it's squeaky yeah. done. Because I don't yeah, the only reason I mentioned it is because I'm sure somebody out there was going, well, well just make just make the rectangles longer. <laughs> yeah. You could make the rectangles longer, but the math to do it is not easily defined for the layman. So this is much easier to understand. Okay, so what's left? Let's make the glow. What is the glow? The glow is nothing more than another segment, a little bit wider, offset a little bit, and maybe with a slightly different alpha or color. So what I chose to do was to make a segment that was wider than this and then move the left one over a little bit to the right, the right one over a little bit to the left, and change the alpha. And then because I always want my glow to be beneath these wall segments, I put the glow in content 3. The path is in content 1, so which we know is over the top of content 3. So let's just uncomment this code. Which, which, which while you're there, uh, is a great illustration of this whole layering concept that we were talking about earlier, is that if you had a single file and you put all your code at top bottom, then everything would be ordered in the, in the order in which you put it. But here you're, you're, you're clearly putting something in the content one and the content three at different points within your code. Um, so you really don't have that sequential layering. The, the, the sequential... I There's know. much less thought that goes into this now. Yeah. Now I just say, I want this on top of that, put it in the right layer, done. Right. Versus, so. oh, wait, I created that last, now i got to move it up, or i got to do some other thing. i got to account for the... Painter's model. Yeah, no, yeah, you're, no you're, model here. you're you're more focused on the the execution of your code as opposed to the layering of it. Absolutely. Okay. So let's just create the, the the glow. It's got the same rotation. The only thing that I did here was is the same problem is is these had to be even longer, so I made them slightly longer. So if you remember the other one was four. I added six pixels to this, uh, and um, I made them wider, so these are not four, they're nine pixels, and that's what we get. So, you know, it's not quite as beautiful as what they did, but this is a first approximation. We can do more to make this nicer. We're not So far, we're not doing any shader effects. We're just doing raw rendering of basic rectangles, and now we got this versus this. So this is theirs, and this is ours. Pretty close. I mean, except for this line in the middle. So let's make let's finish it off. Let's go ahead and make it the rest of the way like theirs. So what's whoops, I'm just closing all the wrong windows here. What's left? Well, we forgot the physics bodies. So for now, I'm just gonna add generic physics bodies to left wall and right wall. I'm gonna make them static and I'm not gonna give them any other arguments today. We'll go all about we'll talk all about collision detection later. I just want to show you and make sure that the hybrid rendering is on. If you go into uh, main Lua, there's a line here on line 36 to render hybrid. And what this will do is it will show us the rectangle. It will also so show us a little bit of physics information when it renders. Uh, let me get back to the wall. So let's save. The code is saved. And now when we redraw this, now it shows us all the same stuff I had before. But you'll see this little hook here. You can't quite see it very well, but there's a red line and a little green line. And this is showing us basically the angle, and then the shading has changed. It's sort of greenish. There is an extra rendering going on that shows us this is where the body is that encompasses the wall. So now we know. I, I know from experience, but just looking at this, this little red line is saying, yep, that is oriented correctly. I can see the outline is perfectly overlapping. I have a hallway with physics going on. Done. So if you wanted to, you could create a little ball, give it a physics body, drop it into that, that hallway there, and it would just go bouncing around down Absolutely. to the end. Of, Actually, uh, I did that on the initial example, but I took it out because we, I moved right into the player. 
So there's still one thing that's wrong with this. This hallway, okay, here's the beauty of this. We're done. Our, that's it. That's the function we need to draw segments from here on. As, in fact, as you can see, we drew one segment, then we drew another one, and another one. And all we did was took the value of the function returned, passed it into the next call, and it created the segment in the right location. So, oh, we should probably turn off that center line, actually. Let's go ahead and do that. So, 56, 57, I basically stopped drawing the line. And that was just a guideline for our conversation, is that correct? Just a guideline for the conversation, not something you needed. Uh, what else is left? If we look at this, this isn't quite right. It's great for a demo, but it's not what is shown in the game. The game hallway is much wider and much longer on the initial segment. So all we do is we go back to game. You'll remember I said in game, in the initialization, we're going to draw the first few segments so everything is there to start the game. So let's make the segment 1,000 pixels long for the first one, and let's make them all 200 pixels wide. And I know this because I tried the values out earlier. But now we have something that looks a lot more like where we are here. 45 degree angle. All eight. Let me turn off the because the coloring is a little goofed up because of the uh, hybrid. And you, and you just said that we're initializing, we're creating the, the first segment, and I assume that means that later on we will programmatically create the. We remaining. will programmatically create additional segments as we need them, mm. but you don't want to create. You can't. It's impossible. It's endless. You couldn't create all the segments because you don't know how many you need. See, you need to create them as you go along. But you need to create a certain number of them to start, otherwise you got no place to start your game. Let me find hybrid here. And while he's doing that, I just want to remind everybody that we will have a link in the show notes to this so that you can pull the code and go and take a look at what Ed's doing. Absolutely. You can download the code uh, <clears throat> and try this out on your own and run it. So now if I run this... Now we've got something that looks a lot like, not exactly, but very close to what they have here. This one I've actually zoomed in a bit more. But that's pretty much it. Um, so we've run out of time. So next week we'll have to talk about it, but I also produced the code for the player and the touch input. I was going to get us as far as actually navigating the hallway, but uh, we won't do that. Because the next bits of this code, really simple. Really simple. This is like the hardest thing. Okay. The, the only other thing that's going to be on this level of difficulty is uh, generating more segments uh, dynamically. But it's pretty easy. So once you figured out how to draw the hallway, letting the cat out of the bag on this project, most of the work is done as far as figuring out difficult math.